Esoteric Orders and Their Work by Dion Fortune Original Printing Writer 1928 PDF Created 2008 Introduction In all ages and among all races, there has existed a tradition concerning certain esoteric schools or fraternities, wherein a secret wisdom unknown to the generality of mankind might be learned, and to which admission was obtained by means of an initiation in which tests and ritual played their part. Whoever is familiar with the literature of folklore and anthropology knows that this belief exists among primitive peoples, from the Eskimos of the Arctic Circle to the Digger Indians of the Tierra del Fuego. Whoever has also studied history knows that it has prevailed from the first dawn of human culture. Today, in the centers of the civilized world, this belief is still alive, and although it may be ridiculed by the orthodox-minded, an unprejudiced observer cannot fail to note that some of the noblest men have been among its advocates, and that the greatest creative intelligences have, almost without exception, born witness to a source of inspiration in the unseen. It is hard to believe that this rumor should be so widespread and so long-lived if it were entirely without foundation. Moreover, the fact that it has the same form among races who have had no intercourse with each other, such as the primitive Mexican and primitive Egyptian, is a further evidence in favor of its truth. It is not possible to demonstrate to those who are without the pale the existence of the organizations to which we have referred, because with the revelations of their secrets comes the obligation of silence. It is permissible, however, to give sufficient information to enable the earnest seeker to discern the path whereby he may approach the entrance to one or another of these schools. And for that purpose, the following teaching concerning the esoteric orders and their functions is placed before the reader. Though the proofs of the statements therein contained must of necessity be withheld until he shall have entitled himself to receive them. The different occult schools declare themselves to be the holders of a secret traditional science, communicated to them, in the first place, by divine founders and enriched and revised from time to time by great teachers. This science concerns the study of the causes that lie behind observable phenomena and condition them. After preliminary tests as to character and fitness, the occult fraternities are prepared to communicate the theory of this science to accepted candidates, and subsequently to convey the powers for its practical use by means of ritual initiations. These briefly, are the claims made for the occult schools by those competent to speak on their behalf. It is very frequently, and very reasonably, asked why it is that societies avowed formed for the service of humanity, and having such valuable teaching to give, should not freely communicate it to all corners, should not, moreover, conduct active propaganda work in order to induce people to come and share in their wisdom, and not, as they appear to be doing, hide themselves away as if seeking by every possible device to avoid observation and prevent themselves being discovered by those who would learn from them. The answer to this question will be found when the nature of occult science is understood. It concerns certain little known powers of the human mind and certain little understood aspects of nature. Were its researchers into these subjects purely theoretical, there would be no need to guard their findings so carefully. But the knowledge of the facts thus discovered immediately reveals their practical applications. Knowledge bestows power in this field of research, even more than in the fields explored by orthodox science. For the power thus rendered available is the power of the mind, and the effects of the use of this power are so far-reaching, whether for good or for evil, that it is a thing not lightly to be trusted into the hands of any human being just as the Dangerous Drugs Acts restricts the purchase and administration of potent drugs, so do those who are the custodians of this ancient traditional knowledge seek to safeguard its use. Being of so subtle a nature, it is impossible to guard it from abuse at the hands of the unscrupulous, 
and therefore its custodians do all in their power to prevent such persons from gaining access to it. Hence the restrictions with which its teachings is hedged about. But the restrictions are no more severe than those which attend the practice of medicine, for which a five years onerous apprenticeship is required. We are so accustomed, however, to see spiritual teaching freely given, to hear the call, Ho, every one that thirsteth, come ye to the waters of life, and drink freely, that we cannot understand a policy which refuses any stream from this spring to those who are athirst. The reason lies in the fact, which cannot be too clearly understood by its would-be neophytes, that occult science is a mental, not a spiritual thing, and is neither good nor bad in itself, but only as it is used. It is potent for good or for evil, it can save souls which no other means could approach, and it can, even without evil intention, destroy them. It is no child's play and few there be who are suited to that path to the heights. Nevertheless, for such as can adventure it, here is a noble quest for the soul, a true crusade against the powers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places. In the hidden places of the world there is so much occult evil, little suspected by those who have not met it face to face, that men and women of courage, strength, and the necessary knowledge are needed to deal with it. The training given in occult schools is designed to produce the adept, a human being who, by intensive training, has raised himself or herself beyond the average development of humanity, and is dedicated to the service of God. Certain work in connection with evolution and the spiritual development and safeguarding of the nations is undertaken by highly trained men and women, though their work is never seen and the place of their training is never known. Their actual training, it may be said, is given on the inner planes, and only the preliminary training which fits them for the inner schools takes place on the physical planes. Consciousness is prepared for its great quest, and adventures alone into the unseen. Not much can be told concerning this training, and not many are suitable for it, but enough has been said to give food for thought.